So I'm going to start with the question today. Here, here's the question. Um, how good are you at waiting? Now, hang on, hang on. How good are you at waiting? Here, here's what I want us to do. I did this with the staff this week. It was really interesting to see their answers. I want you to honestly assess yourself right now. And I want you to do it on a scale from zero, which means you are horrible at it, to 10, which means that you have mastered it. So go ahead and honestly assess yourself. Put, find your number on that scale right now. Those of you at home that are watching, do the same thing. Now, here's what I want you to do next. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to shout out your number, okay? And I want you to do that so loud that Doug, who's sitting right here, he can hear you because I'm going to have a question for him afterwards. So are you ready? You got your number in your mind? I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. All right, Doug, here's the first question. What was the highest number you heard? A nine. Wow. Somebody want to raise their hand and say, yeah, that was a nine? <laughs> the rest of us will be like, I can't believe you're a nine. What was the lowest number you heard? I'm pretty sure I heard a three. A three. Three to nine. That's pretty interesting. When we did it with the staff the other day, guess what our numbers were? Zero. Not going to tell you who that was. Two, five. Isn't that amazing? Now, um, if you want to know where your pastor is on that, just ask Debbie. She can answer. In fact, I started to, I started to say, why don't you now have the person that you came, you came with to answer the question for you? Do you think that number would be higher or lower? Lower. lower. <laughs> well, um, it's hard. It's hard sometimes. And uh, if, you, if you enjoyed counting the words, the special word that I had last week, I'm going to give you another word or two words today to count. And here's the word, believe it or not, the word is wait or waiting. And so your starting number right now is three. I've said it three times. And maybe you'll want to count that. Some of the kids did great at that last week and some of the adults did too. Um, it's hard sometimes to wait, especially like on Christmas Eve. Um, some of you maybe remember this video we showed a couple of years ago, but it's so good. It's a Christmas Eve video. Watch, watch this little video I want to share with you. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. The tricky clock tick-tocking, each painfully long minute unlocking. The tumbly, jumbly, can't close your eyes feeling. What will it be? When will it be? Oh, the anticipation, the watching, the wishing and waiting to let the wiggles and giggles and goosebumps go. To find, to see, to finally know. What will it be? When will it be? Oh, the expectation, the what-ifs, the oh-mys fairly shaking, longing for this night's joy all year, that moment of hope so very near. Oh, but would they, could they, imagine a gift so great, a gift that compelled the whole world to wait? When a heavenly Father gave all mankind his Son, the One, Love defined. The magic of Christmas is more brilliant, you see, than a bag or a box tucked under a tree. The true love of Christmas really began when holy God became holy. Man. Joseph, it's time. He's here. Remember that excitement? I mean, I can't imagine what her excitement and Joseph's excitement was on that first night. You know, I, I remember uh, uh, Jim Towson when he was when he was young. I think it's probably the same year. Some of you may have seen the the picture we posted. I posted this week on Facebook of, of the Bah Humbug uh, Christmas card that we sent out of Jim, where he was just worn out of trying to take the perfect Christmas picture. I think it was that same year, we had everything in place. I mean, Christmas morning was going to be like the biggest day. He was finally old enough where he could come out and, and really experience Christmas. And so we had, the lighting was just right. The trees, you know, family was gathered. He was still asleep in bed. The door was closed down the hallway. We had the fire. I mean, we had the cameras. We were ready. 
And so uh, Debbie went back to get him and wake him up and say, it's Christmas, it's Christmas, come in to the room. And so she brought him down the hallway and she opened the door and all of us were so excited and we just yelled, Merry Christmas, Jim. And he just slammed the door and turned around and went the other way. (laughs) It's like the big moment, just all wasted, all that anticipation for us anyway. Well, we've been using We Three Kings, the chorus to it is kind of our theme for this Advent season and Christmas season. And today, I wanted us to focus on Star of Light. We've been singing about that. We've been talking about the light. In our scripture passage today, I'm continuing the story of Herod and the wise men and the star. And it's in chapter 2 verse uh, of Matthew, verses 7 and 8. So let's, let's read this uh, passage. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. Remember, they had already come to him and said, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star uh, and followed it. Where is he? And uh, they called together all the religious leaders, and they said, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, this is the continuation of it. So then uh, he told them, uh, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. You know, the, the Advent theme for today, uh, as we did the Advent candle, is peace. It's peace. That's something that King Herod lacked completely. In fact, you know, he was known as Herod the Great. There are a number of Herods in the Scripture. This is not the same King Herod who was living and in authority at the time that Jesus was crucified. This was a different King Herod, an earlier King Herod. He was known as Herod the Great. And he had been appointed by the Romans as king of Judea. So in his mind, he was convinced he was, he had the title king of the Jews. Now, he, it's interesting because he practiced Judaism. And the reason he did that was to try to gain favor with the Jews, even though he wasn't an actual Jew himself. And, and he thought that that would have them accept him and legitimize his kingship over them. But they would have nothing to do with it. And that infuriated him. And so he was covered up in fear, always looking over his shoulder to see who's going to be the next threat to my power and my position. And so he was filled with fear. And now he hears that there's a new king of the Jews. And you can imagine how that ramps up his anxiety and fear. But this is what we know. We know in the passage we read just a minute ago that he was being disingenuous when he said he wanted to go worship the king. That's not at all his intention. In fact, we'll see a little bit later on in the scripture that he intended to do away with this so-called king of the Jews. You'll find that actually in Matthew 2, the same, the same chapter. But look at verses 16 and 17. It says this, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. You remember what happened? The angel appeared to the wise men after they saw Jesus uh, in Bethlehem, and they said, go a different way home so that they didn't go back through Jerusalem and report to Herod what happened and where Jesus was. So Herod, it says, sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And this is what I got to thinking about uh, King Herod. I, I thought, you know, Herod represents in so many ways the darkness that covered the earth at the time Jesus was born. We talked a little bit about that last week. But this is the same darkness that had been predicted back when Isaiah was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. 750 years, we learned. 750 years earlier, he prophesied that there was going to be this light that was going to come into the darkness. And it's in Isaiah chapter 9. Look what it says. He said this a long time before Jesus came. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. I love the idea that it's a great light. It's not just a light or some light. It's a great light. This magnificent light is going to burst through the darkness. And for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Absolutely beautiful that God foretold that some 750 years before Jesus came. And so that light did shine as we know. And we sing about it with the Three wise men, star of wonder, star of light, star of royal beauty bright. Well, this darkness idea kind of stuck with me, and and I I read a devotion 
that was part of an Advent series. Uh, and it's by uh, a, a girl named Casey Page Colbreth. And it's about waiting. It really spoke to me. I shared it with our staff this past week. And they said, you know what, Jimmy, you need, you need to share that with our congregation. And so I kind of remapped everything I was doing and, and decided to share that with you today. And it, and it starts, it takes us back, this devotion did, takes us back to Genesis where that very first darkness covered the earth. And, and I want you just, just for a moment, just to think about that. Uh, as we look at the Genesis passage, you, you can imagine that everything was just covered in darkness. L look what it says in Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. Can you imagine that? I, I, I've got it in my head. And, and the Spirit of God, don't miss this part, was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God spoke. Here's what he said. Let there be light. And there was light. You can just imagine being there in that moment and, and seeing that darkness just evaporate with this incredible light that comes because God spoke the word, let there be light. And, and here's what I've discovered, and maybe you have too, that at this time of the year, during this season, we as Christians spend a lot of time waiting, anticipating, expecting that God's going to do something again in our lives like he did in the beginning and like he did when Christ was born. You know, there's this earthly waiting that we have, anticipating Christmas Day and all the joy and excitement and family and fun, but there's also a deeper waiting. It's a spiritual waiting. It's waiting for this same Spirit of God to hover over us and over the chaos of our world, but also over the chaos that rages inside of us at times. There's this sense that God's Spirit is hovering. He's hovering over us, even now. And we wait. And we wait. And here, here's what we don't do. We, we don't choose to flee from the darkness. I'm not so sure that we can flee from it, actually. Um, Sometimes there, there, there are moments in our lives where we feel like the darkness is closing in. It, it may not be my darkness. It may just be the darkness around me. Or maybe it's the darkness that some family member is experiencing right now. Or maybe it's somebody at work. Or maybe it's somebody that you know and love and care for. And you sense that there's this chaos and there's this void in them. And it just, we, we find ourselves sitting sometimes if the darkness is in our lives, we find ourselves sitting there in our own formlessness, just like that creation moment and that emptiness, that void that the Bible talks about. And, and while we wait, here's what we do. We, we do so in trust that the Spirit is close to our void. Or maybe it's close to the void of those around us or in our world, that he, even though there's this, this darkness that is covering the world right now, we can sense that God's Spirit is hovering over it. And, and you might think about it this way. If we, if we just envision what God did in the beginning, that we can sense right now that there's, there's the faint sound of that Spirit hovering and God's on the edge of speaking, it's almost like you can hear the first breath starting in the word he's going to speak. It's going to be a generative word, a creative word, even now, that's moving over the surface of our uncertainty, or that that we experience, and it's ready to speak light into the darkness we have. And, and so here we are, this time of the year, and we're waiting again. And we wait. We wait for the one who has come to keep coming and to keep coming again. I, I love what Paul says when he writes about all the darkness that he went through in his life. And he says, but, but our Lord saved us. He did save us. He continues to save us. And he will save us from it. There's that trust in God's spirit that's hovering over 
all that we're going through in life. And so we wait for that wind, that spirit of God that hovered over those primordial waters in the beginning that also overshadowed a teenage girl named Mary to come again and, and to breathe life into our darkness. It's pretty deep, isn't it? But here's the reality. There's something deep inside of all of us. And listen, even if you don't believe the story, there's something deep inside of all of us that longs for his coming in our lives right now. And here's why. Because for some of us, the way we see the world around us, or maybe for some of us in the way we're experiencing the world right now, the darkness is so heavy, it's so palpable, it's so real that, that we worry that he's not truly already here. Could it be? And, and there are just times in our lives, and maybe, maybe it's not you right now, and that's okay, but maybe it will be you sometime down the road, or maybe it's been you in the past. There are times in our life where all we see is darkness and emptiness and chaos. And so I wanted you to do something. i got a place in your sermon notes for you. Um, I wonder if you sense that in some way right now. It could be with the loss of a loved one. It could be with medical issues. It could be with financial issues. It could be with marital issues, relationship issues. It could be in any form that darkness seems to be trying to creep into our lives right now. And I wondered if you would name it. I've got a place for you in your sermon notes where you could just name the darkness, the emptiness, the chaos that's in your life or maybe somebody that you know and love or maybe that you sense in the world right now because there's power over it when we name it. And so I want you to just take a moment. Maybe just close your eyes. Just name it before God right now. This is the darkness. This is the emptiness. This is the chaos that I sense around us right now. Would you do that? The Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the darkness that covered the waters. And, and all we can do, all we really can do is wait. And as we do, we wonder if anything new or beautiful can really be born in us today. But there's hope. There's hope because even in our doubt, even in our despair, the reality is that the Lord is hovering over us right now. He's hovering over us as a mother who will not leave her children. He, he's hovering over us as a father who protects his little ones at all costs, no matter what it takes. He's hovering over us as an older sibling who wants to carry the heavy load for the younger ones so that their burdens will be lighter. And he's hovering. And in the darkness, we, we can't always see him. We may not see him. And we, we just wish, we, we pray, if only I could see, if only I knew you were here. But, but here's, here's the hope. In Advent, in this time of the season, this is where we are. In Advent, we choose to hope that in the fullness of time, we will see him. We will see him. His presence among us will be felt. That's what Advent is all about. We will see him. Sometimes it might be in the most unexpected places. It, it might be on a dirt road where we are bewildered by shattered expectations, things we thought were going to happen and they never happen, and they're shattering to us. It might be in a room full of friends where we're enjoying a meal and we're talking about and wondering about what might be next for us. Or it might be in an early morning sunrise. 
We see the beauty. We've had some beautiful sunrises and sunsets around here lately. And, and we, we're, we sense his presence there. And, and all that we thought about life and the power of death just melts away and it's turned upside down. We'll see. I was thinking about that in the beginning. And, and who knows how long the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness that covered the waters before that eternal voice, God Almighty, spoke. His voice echoed through this vast, empty expanse. I mean, if we'd been there in the waiting, in the pause, if we had been there, perhaps we would have thought there's no way anything is ever going to happen. It's just not going to. And yet, that early darkness, that early void in the beginning was just as pregnant with the Holy Spirit hovering as it was in the womb of the one who would hold the Son of God. And so all of us are, are, are waiting on something, often, often wondering if God has forgotten us. And, and so in some ways, we're like those vast oceans of chaos, that water. Oh, and, and at the same time, we're also wombs of some great expectation that's about to be born in us right now, over which the Spirit of God is hovering. Isn't that good news? That's good news. And so I want to encourage you that in your waiting now, in our waiting, as we're waiting for this world to get better, the world that you and I live in, and we look around and see all that's happening in our waiting, let the birth of Christ, His coming, encourage us. Let's be encouraged. Let's be hopeful. Because just because God hasn't come through as far as we can see doesn't mean that He's abandoned us by any stretch of the imagination. And so when we set up our manger scenes at home, we need to take hope in the reality and know that we're loved and prized by the God who stepped down from heaven and arrived at just the right time. God sent Jesus to us. I love this whole concept, at just the right time. In fact, Paul writes about that in Galatians. Here's what he says. He says, but when the right time finally came, if you go look at that in some other translations, you'll hear it say this. It says that in the fullness of time. I mean, I love that idea of the fullness. It just, it, just, it just evokes the idea of Mary being pregnant with Jesus. In the fullness of time, in the right time, when the time was right, God sent his own son. And he came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might become children of God or God's children. I mean, no wonder. I mean, Herod was all about power and might and, and, and the darkness that covered the world. And he was, a, he was afraid that someone was going to take it away. He had no idea what, how God had been hovering over and what God was about to do and to speak light into the darkness. And, and there's no way the darkness could overcome the light. And that's the hope and the glory that we experience too when God moves in our life. There's no way that the darkness we're experiencing can overcome the light that God speaks into our lives. And so right now, no matter, no matter where you are, no matter how, how formless, no matter how void or dark or chaotic it may be in your life or in those that you love, the Spirit of God is hovering over you and over them right now while we wait. He's hovering. And at any moment, he can speak light into the darkness. Just as he spoke light into the darkness in the beginning, just as he spoke incredible, beautiful, earth-shattering light into the darkness of a broken world 2,000 years ago, he'll speak again. This very minute, listen to this, this very minute, he's working for his glory and for your good, even though the circumstances may look like he's not, God's going to come through on schedule, on time, fulfilling his long-appointed plans for you 
and for me. So don't give up before the time is right. Don't do that. Here's, here's the reality of Advent and Christmas. First, it's this, that Jesus is the light for us when all other lights go out. Isn't that good news? Because there are times in our lives when we absolutely feel like the lights have gone out. But he's the light. The word has spoken. It is speaking and it will speak again. That's the promise. And so when I look at Advent and Christmas, I'm so excited about it. I love everything about it. But, but what it teaches me is this. It's to believe that at any moment, Jesus can speak light into our darkness. In any moment as he's hovering over us right now. And the day will come, the moment will come, and we'll hear that whisper of his voice blowing across the surface of our bare hearts. And he'll say, let there be light. He is here. God is here. Father, thank you for, uh, for that reality. You know, it, it does seem like right now, maybe not in our personal lives, but in the world around us, there's so much darkness, so much chaos, so much void that we need you to speak light into. Maybe it's for us personally. Would you do it again? Would you speak again as you have before? As we wait, trusting that the Spirit of God is hovering over us, even now. That's the best news any of us could ever receive. For at any moment, you can speak light into our darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.